Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Pizza Legends. In this video, we're gonna implement our overworld cutscene system, which is my favorite part of making this kind of game. This is the system that's gonna allow us to puppet characters around and tell little stories by giving them single commands on what to do. My personal favorite example of this type of thing is in Pokemon Red and Blue, when you'd be walking around the map and you'd step into a certain spot and then out of nowhere, your rival would show up and challenge you to a battle. This system is what's going to enable that kind of interaction in our game. This is also the same piece that will power just idle behaviors that people do on the map. And so by the end of this, we're going to be able to configure our individual people to be walking around, spinning around. They'll just feel more alive. Fair warning that this video covers arguably the most complex bits of code in the whole project. But if you stick with me to the end, we're going to have an awesome set of tools that we can use to tell great stories with. Let's get started. So there's two different types of event cues that we're gonna to handle today, and I'm gonna explain them now. The first is gonna be an internal person behavior loop. So uh, that's like what a character does during normal time. When nothing else is going on, I'm an NPC standing around, um, I'm gonna walk left and then stand left and then walk right and then stand up. Um, this is just what characters do when nothing else is going on. The second type of cue we're gonna talk about is a global map cutscene. That's where something has happened in the game, like the hero has stepped to a certain spot or talked to a certain person, and all of the action stops and focuses in on just one event cue. Uh, so for example, we might guide the hero to walk to a certain spot and then guide a different NPC to walk, you know, to meet the hero and then say something or do something. This is really gonna be the key mechanism that we use to tell stories in the game. Now there's a lot of code that's shared between these two systems, in fact, almost all of it. Uh, so we're gonna implement this internal person behavior loop first, and then at the end of the video, see how we can apply those same things to make the global map cutscene work too. So the first thing we're gonna do is add a unique identifier to our game objects. We're gonna be writing code that's like, hey, you go do this, and then you go do this. For that, hey, you part to work, we need a, like a name for each object to have. That way we can call them from the outside. So I'm gonna to go to gameobject.js and right above, uh, this is mounted and all this first thing, the very first line I'm gonna say is this.id equals null for starters. And then when objects are created, this value will get set. So let's pop over to where game objects are created and that's an overworld map. There's this method called mount objects. Currently mount objects iterates through all the values in this.gameobjects, uh, but that won't give us the key of each value. So we need to change this a little bit so that we have the key we can use the key for each object to pipe in as the ID. So I'm gonna change this code to be object.keys instead, and that'll iterate through each key in the object. So this becomes key over here. And then we can keep this kind of same pattern going on by just saying uh, let object equal game objects, whatever the key is, to look up that same one. Uh, and then we'll, of course we need to change it down here too, to be object. I just feel like object is a little bit more clear than the letter O. And then here we'll say object.id is going to be uh, whatever the key is in the object. So this will be like hero or npc1. Uh, to look that up, we can look at our game objects like here, for example. So hero, npc a, npc b. That's going to be automatically be used as the ID. That way we don't have to like manually define one like this. This would be fine too, but I find that it's just like an extra thing that you have to do. So it's nice when the system just automatically does it for you. So. So to better demonstrate the point of this video, we're gonna add another NPC to our map. So I'll come down to where all of our maps are defined. We're in demo room right now, and we've got two hero and NPC one. Uh, I'm gonna make a new one here called NPC two. And these NPCs are gonna have their own behavior patterns. So we can kind of see the difference and the, the possibilities of the varieties you can do and all that stuff. Uh, but let's see, let's make this NPC two in the skin so they look different. Um, and I don't like these keys already because uh, it's, they don't match up with the skin. So I'll just change that to NPC A and NPC B. And this person will update to be like three, eight, seven. And when I reload the browser, you can see that our third person's appearing here. Now I'm gonna start defining uh, behavior loops on each of our NPCs here. So starting with the second one, I'm gonna make a new key called behavior loop. And that's gonna be an array. And uh, each behavior event is gonna look kind of like this. It's gonna have a type on it with a string, like walk or stand, uh, and then a direction on which way we should walk or stand. And then if it's walk, maybe say like, or sorry, if it's stand like this, uh, we're also gonna have a time on like how long we want you to stand that way. So we'll say direction up and then time 800 milliseconds or so. So this person's gonna walk to the left and then they're gonna stand facing upwards 
uh, waiting for 800 milliseconds, and then this behavior will be done. Since this is an idle behavior loop, again, meaning that this stuff happens when nothing else global is happening in the story, in the scene, uh, this person will just repeat their loop. So they'll walk to the left, stand up, walk to the left, stand up. Now it's worth noting that as a map content author, you need to be careful about what these NPCs do. Uh, this person is gonna walk to the left and then stand up and then walk to the left. He's gonna keep moving left. So eventually he's gonna be like all the way to the left side of the screen. You probably need something in his behavior to circle back to the right so that he kind of ends up having a loop. Most of the NPCs in this game won't walk, so it's really not that big of a deal. But the ones that do, we want to make sure that they don't end up in some kind of loop that doesn't have that symmetry to it, unless that's what you're going for, I guess. So to give us that symmetry, I'm just going to paste in a few more here. Uh, these are just more walking instructions. So we'll, after that stand up, we'll walk up and then walk to the right and then walk down. And that should give us a little loop here that the character keeps walking in. I'm going to do a similar thing with NPC A up here. Uh, so her behavior loop will, again, be an array, and she's just going to stand left. It's going to be like one of those spinning people in Pokemon that just kind of like look one way and then they look a different way. Um, we'll say up, and then how about over to right, and right can last a little bit longer. It's nice when these values are a little bit random, that way it doesn't feel so sequenced. And then back over to up for just a little bit there. So she will spend her time looking to the left and then looking up and then looking to the right for a little bit longer and then looking up again and then turning back to the left when her loop repeats. Now we need to be ready to receive these behavior loop arrays in our game object, which currently we're not doing. So in our constructor down here, I'll add a little section. It's gonna say this dot behavior loop is gonna be whatever config behavior loop has, whatever we pass in. If nothing, then have it be an empty array. And then we need a index to keep track of which behavior we're on right now. So I'll say behavior loop index, that's gonna start at zero. Now when this object is added to the scene, we wanna go ahead and kick off the behavior loop. And so we have this clear mount method that you know, adds us to the scene. Uh, here, we're gonna say, you know, if we have a behavior kick off after a short delay, we're gonna leave a little bit of a timing gap so that our global overworld cutscene loop can come in first potentially. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a second, but uh, for now, we're just gonna say set timeout after 10 milliseconds, I'm gonna call a new method called this.doBehaviorEvent, and we're gonna go ahead and pass in that map state. Tiny bit of cleanup happening here, update. So down here, I'll define that new method, doBehaviorEvent, takes in the map. And this is where we wanna start executing those behaviors one by one. So in this method, the first thing we wanna do is identify the event that we should be working on right now. So we'll say this event is going to be this dot behavior loop, this dot loop index to pull out the event at position that we're working on right now. Now, the next thing we need is to make sure an event has a who defined. Uh, in the case where, of our global cutscene loop that we'll work on in a little bit, uh, each event is going to have the who already defined on it. But in the case of these behaviors here, see that we have type and direction and, and time and that kind of stuff, but the actually who needs to do it is not on there yet. And instead of having to manually define it every single time, we're just gonna add it in dynamically here. Uh, so we'll say event.who is gonna be this.id. So this will be like hero or NBCA, NBCB, whatever the ID of the game object is. Next, we're gonna take this event, which is actually more like an event config. Let's just make that a little more clear right now. And we're gonna create a new instance of something called an overworld event handler. So we'll say, event handler is going to be a new overworld event. And that's going to take in some configuration. We haven't made this class yet, but we will in a second. It's going to take in um, the map and then event can be uh, event config. Now we're going to swing back to this in a second. I think for this part, it's going to be more clear if we just get through this whole method first. Basically an overworld event is going to contain the code that actually instructs the people to do the thing they need to do. And it won't be just people events. It's also going to be uh, other kinds of overworld events in the future, like text messages popping up or music changes, battles starting, all kinds of stuff are gonna be overworld events. All of that logic and uh, instructional stuff is gonna be held in this class here. On each event, we're gonna fire an init method. 
Now, each one of these events is going to take a little bit of time. So if I'm instructing someone to walk to the left, we know it's going to take, you know, a few frames for them to get to the left. It's not going to finish right away. We want this code to actually wait until this event is finished. And then once it's finished, then we can move on to the next one in our loop. And so um, init is going to actually end up returning a promise for us. And whenever that promise is resolved, then we can go ahead and continue with the loop. So what I'm going to do is um, use the await keyword here and then go ahead and mark our method as async. And if you've never seen async await before, this is a good quick introduction to it. Basically, this await keyword is going to tell the code that this bit is going to take a while to resolve. Um, it's asynchronous code. So nothing below this line is going to execute until this thing comes back as finished. Uh, in order to use the await keyword, we must mark any uh, function or method that contains it with this async keyword. So that's why that's there. So once this async part is done, we can go ahead and increase our index. And then if we're at the end of our loop, we can go ahead and reset that count down to zero. Just to reiterate one more time, if we didn't have this await keyword, which again, will tell the code to kind of wait here until this event is done, um, this loop would just continue to fire and we'd essentially have an infinite loop because the, um, the code would just always be kind of iterating through and immediately doing the event. Uh, this is gonna give us that nice timing gap where we're gonna wait for this to resolve and then we can move to the next one. And then if we you know, don't have another one, we can start over at the beginning. That's gonna give us this nice behavior loop. So when this behavior is done, we want to go ahead and just call the same method again, passing in that same map. Let's go ahead and add some comments here for some quick clarity. So this block here is, um, you know, setting the next event to fire. This one here is where we're going to, you know, create an event instance out of our next event config. This is setting up our event with relevant info. Now we're going to add a block up here um, that's basically going to short circuit the function. Sometimes we're going to uh, get this method called on a game object that doesn't actually have a behavior uh, array to do. Maybe it starts empty. Um, or maybe there's something more important going on right now, our global overworld cutscene. And when one of those is going on, we always want to honor that first and ignore or temporarily pause whatever each character wants to do on their own. So um, what I'm going to do is add a little check here. If map dot is cutscene plane, which doesn't exist yet, we're going to add that later on in this video. Um, or if my behavior loop length is just empty, like it's zero, then just stop here. So let's start filling in some of the gaps that we've left here. For one, we're referencing a check on the map called is cutscene plane, which doesn't exist yet. So let's add that. We're going to go into our overworld map class, at the very top of overworld map.js, and just start a new um, property here that's going to say is cutscene plane. And we're just going to default that to false. We'll start toggling this on and off as we get there later on in this video. Next, I'm coming back into gameobject.js. And we've created a new class called overworld event, but that doesn't exist in our code base yet. So let's go ahead and add that now. Add a new JavaScript file, overworld event.js. And you guessed it, it's a class like we talked about. Um, and in there, we're going to have a event that's passed in uh, and a map. Let's see, what did we call that exactly? Map and event. Okay, perfect. So um, here I'm just going to use some destructuring to say map an event, and then we'll say this dot map is going to be whatever map is this dot event is going to be event. Now here's how this class is going to be structured. Each type of command that we can do or each type of overworld event is going to have a method on the class. So for example, stand uh, is going to be a method, walk is going to be a method. Um, each method is going to include a resolver. Uh, which will basically be a function that it can call to tell the system that the event is done. So for example, for walk, we're going to instruct an NPC to start walking. And then as soon as that walking is completed, we're going to call resolve. 
and that resolve will uh, resolve our promise that we're waiting for in this await line. And then once that resolve has happened, then we can go ahead and continue on with the loop. So over here, when we call, let's see, we create the overworld event and then we call init on it. So we need an init method. And that is gonna be what's gonna kick off one of these actual instructional methods. So from init here, we're gonna return a new promise and the promise is gonna have a resolve that comes back with it. We need to dynamically call whatever method is defined in our event that was passed into the constructor of overworld event here. So we're gonna say this and then this.event.type and that will match up with one of these methods here, like stand or walk. We're gonna have a lot more in the future, but right now we're just dealing with these kind of people-centric ones. And then we wanna call this like so, but we wanna pass in our resolver, resolver there. That way each individual method can call it whenever it's done. And to be honest here, I'm kind of mixing like a functional style with the object-oriented like class-based style. Like I, I could probably say this dot resolve equals resolve and then call this dot resolve instead of passing it in like this. You know, just trying to give you options, showing you different ways to do stuff. Now to finally close the loop on our event system here, we need walk to uh, eventually call this resolve function. So we want to like instruct somebody to start walking and then when they're done, we're going to call resolve. Uh, do you remember how in the previous video we set up uh, this start behavior method that passes in some instructions on what a person should start doing. Uh, this is exactly why we did it, so that we can kind of reference a person that exists, tell them to do something, and then know when they're done doing it. So in here, what I'm going to do is find the person that we want to uh, reference. So say this dot map dot game objects, uh, and then the key of this event, right? So this dot event dot who. So this will be like NPC A. And then all together, this will pull up a reference to that person game object. We're going to say who.startBehavior. First, we need to pass in a state object. And then we pass in the config for the behavior that we want them to do. So the type is going to be walk. They need a direction. We are storing the direction on the event. So this.event.direction. And remember, that comes from over here in our overworld map. We have a type and we have a direction. This first argument to start behavior uh, is that state object and it's gonna want a map. And so we can just pass through our map. You can see that this now looks pretty much the same as in person JS. When we do a start behavior, we pass in state and walk. In this case, we're passing through state a few different times, but the uh, structure and signature is all the exact same. Okay, so we are firing off a walk instruction on a person now. Uh, but currently, we don't have a clear way to know when that walking is complete. If we pop open to person.js, uh, we know that there's some logic in here that can potentially restart walking after we start one. Um, but it, it's sort of all internal with this counter, this moving progress remaining counter. There's no clear signal that's like, hey, I finished this thing for external classes to listen to. So that's what we're going to add next. So in person.js, when we're down ticking moving progress remaining, we can then afterwards check if it's zero. If it is zero, that means that uh, we finished the walk. So now here we can fire off a clear signal that's like, hey, this person is done moving. Uh, right now, it's obviously, of course, what we're working on right now with completing these cutscene loops. So we know we can move on to the next behavior event after this walk is complete. But in the future, this signal is also going to help us out with things like hero footstep detection, where the hero is now done moving. Now we can check, hey, is there anything interesting at that spot that the hero moved into? Maybe like a cutscene trigger space, or um, should we start a battle if you walked into like a wild tall grass kind of thing? This sort of signal pattern is going to come in handy in a few different spots. Now to fire off the signal, we're going to embrace a native browser feature called custom events. Uh, we've done all kinds of work before by adding like click handlers and scroll handlers. And you know, you've probably seen all that kind of stuff before with events that the browser automatically detects and gives you. It's also possible to create your own. Uh, so say we want to make a new pizza legend specific event type called a person's done walking. We can just define that in JavaScript and then dispatch it and listen to it as if it were any of those other kinds of more standard events. So to define one, I'm going to say const event is going to be a new custom event. Remember, this is native from the browser. Custom event wants a name for the event. So we'll say person walking complete. 
Uh, and then uh, you can give it this optional like configuration object to give more detail about that event that happened. And to do that, you add a uh, the key here. It must be called detailed. And then in here, you can just add data that you want to send up. So who ID is going to be this ID. And then to emit it, we're going to say document dispatch event passing in this event that we created. Now I can tell you we're going to be doing this event pattern a ton in the next few videos going forward. And so rather than you know having this kind of block of code sprinkled in a few different places throughout the game, uh, I think we should just move it into a util. So I'm going to open up our utils file and make a new one. And that's going to take in our name and detail and then do all that same stuff. So I'll come back to person, grab this block here, paste it into our util, and then just start plugging in the values. So name will go in this first spot here. And then the detail object that we want to include in the event, we'll just rely on structuring here. So this helper is really just shorthand to do all that same stuff where we pass in the name we want and then making sure that the configuration object is named with the correct key and all that. Uh, we should just be set up and ready to use it. So back in person, JS, we'll turn this into utils.emit event, the name of the event, and then our object. And now all of this stuff can go away. And it's just a little bit cleaner to look at. And again, we're going to be doing this a lot. So this just kind of pays off in the future. So now that this is being fired at this position, we can actually listen for it in our overworld event. So coming up to walk um, right after we start the behavior, we're going to say document .add event listener, just like again, just like we go with a click or something like that. Um, when this event fires, we're going to uh, fire a complete handler. I'm going to define that right here. The uh, reference to it's going to be important when we want to stop listening for it. So whenever this overworld event class sees the browser event, person walking complete, fire off, then we're good to like resolve this behavior and move on with our behavior queue. But we do want to check and make sure that the, the event that we saw actually came from the person that we care about, because these events are scoped to a person. We have uh, potentially multiple people walking around on the map. They're all going to be firing off these I'm done walking events. We need to make sure that you know we're only reacting to the one that we really care about. And so that's why in that event detail, we included the who ID. So we can say e.detail.who ID, make sure that that is equal to this event.who, which remember every event has a who on it. That's the key of the game object, the thing we add at the beginning of the video. So if those are equal, we can say uh, we don't want to listen anymore. So remove event listener, uh, bring it over the same key, and then also a reference to our complete handler. So it disconnects properly, and then we can resolve our promise. Clean up just a little bit. I'm going to add some comments for clarity. So now we've been doing a lot of coding, but haven't really seen how any of this stuff has landed in the browser yet. There's just been a lot to set up before we do that. Uh, so let's go ahead and include our overworld event on the page. That's a step we haven't done yet. So new JavaScript file, we're going to make sure that overworld event is also included. So now let's pop over into the browser and see that when we load up the game, our NPC does do his first behavior event index. Um, I believe his second one in the loop, though, is a stand event, and we're not handling that one yet. So if we go to game overworld map and look at his queue, yeah, he walks and then he stands, which we're not resolving the stand being complete yet. So let's just take that out for a second and see if he does the uh, the walk left up, right down thing right. Reloading, and there it is. Now you can see when he's walking though, he's not animating properly. I think we're missing a call to our person um, update sprite method. So under here, when we say ready to walk, on right under where we're gonna set this to 16, let's go ahead and fire that again. So this dot update sprite, passing in the state as before. And then when I reload here, now he's animating properly as well. Now, in order to get that stand instruction back in, we need to modify our person code to be kind of stand friendly. Right now in start behavior, we're only starting a behavior type for walk. So let's go ahead and add one for stand. So here we'll add a check that's like if uh, behavior.type is stand, then we want to go down this path instead. 
so what standing is, is basically just the character is going to stand stationary at the direction that we specified for the time that we specified. So I'm going to like walk over here and then stand here and look this way for a second and then like turn, rotate, maybe face this way instead. Uh, so to do that timing part, we're going to use a set timeout in JavaScript. So um, in here, the stand event itself is going to pass in a time, like how long the standing should last. So we can say behavior.time is going to be the second argument here. Whenever that time has passed, we can go ahead and use that utility that we just set up. So utils.emit custom event. Uh, just like we called this one down here, person walking complete, we can bring that up here and rename it to person stand complete. Or standing would work too, I don't know. And then just like before, we're going to pass in that same um, identifier of who is completing the stand. So it's going to be who ID and then this ID. And now we need to actually fire off the instruction to start standing. Uh, so an overworld event, just like in the walk type, uh, we do this kind of start behavior thing. We need to do the same kind of thing, but for stand. And so just for kicks for now, I'm going to copy some stuff over. I'll copy off this whole block, leaving out the success handler, the event listener for a second. I'm going to change the type here to stand. And finally, we need to make sure that we pass in the time on the stand event. Uh, so we'll say time is this dot event dot time. Again, this is essentially just like passing through all the keys that are defined on our behavior objects here. If I go to overall map and look at these, we're kind of manually like passing each one of these things through. Uh, you could just pass the whole event through. Sometimes there may be cases where there are keys on here that you don't need or want in the, the person object. Sometimes I just like to keep it explicit like this. It's totally your call. Now when I reload, you can see that the people are standing and honoring that little timing gap, kind of rotating around over here. This guy over here is, you know, doing a little bit of a pause in that up stand and this is second, his second event there and then continuing his loop. So at this point, our characters can kind of just do their thing in the world when nothing else is going on. There still are a few edge cases though, and we're gonna take care of those now. Okay, so two quick things we need to take care of. For one, when I get in this person's way who's walking around, his uh, collision detection code is just going to stop him from moving, and then it's going to sort of cut off his event loop. So if I get in his way here, um, he's going to stop, and then there's nothing in his code that asks him to retry after maybe a little bit of a delay uh, for when I get out of the way. So even when I step out of the way, he's still just kind of stuck there. He's never going to move again. The other problem is that now when I walk underneath a character, you can see that my hero's hat kind of uh, layers underneath the NPC improperly because we're not doing any concept of like why sorting when we're drawing our characters. Uh, it's technically always been a problem in the project so far, but we haven't really been moving characters around too much, so it hasn't been very present. Um, but now you can see that it is a problem. So we want to start rearranging the drawing order, making sure that characters that are more southern are drawn on top of characters that are more northern. So let's go ahead and take care of this walk collision thing first. So what we're going to do is pass in an explicit retry flag into cases where the overworld cutscene loop is controlling characters. Uh, and what this is going to do is Basically, if, if for any reason the walk fails, we're going to schedule a retry to happen um, in just a little bit afterwards. This isn't always appropriate to do because, for example, the hero is controlled by the, the player with the arrow keys. And so if the hero walks into the wall or something like that, we don't necessarily want to retry that walk into the wall because the hero has full control to just do something else instead. Uh, but if something interrupts a scheduled walk, for example, that's a case where we may want to retry it. So anytime the overworld event fires a walk command on a person, we're good to pass in this retry flag. So now we can go to where this event type is consumed in person JS. We have our walk logic here and you can see right here, we say stop here if space is not free. Um, we can add a little bit of a, yeah, but if behavior.retry is there, then we wanna set a timeout and maybe, um, I think like 10 milliseconds is good. Then we just want to recall this same function with the same arguments being passed. So just like this, just like this. And now when I reload the browser, you can see that I can like block this guy and he's just gonna kind of keep following me around. He, while I'm blocking him from doing what he wants to do, he's gonna continually retry until he can do it. And then he'll continue on with his behavior loop. So I'll get out of his way. And now you can see it's back to business as normal. So now let's take a look at this other issue where the characters aren't being drawn in the correct order. 
I'm going to pop back over to our friend Overworld JS. Haven't been here in a while, it feels like. Um, and in here, there's a part in the code uh, where the game objects are being drawn in the game loop. Uh, right before we iterate through each of those objects to draw them to the screen, we want to go ahead and sort them by their Y value. So I'll just use the native sort method, um, giving arguments A and B, like the current one and the next one. And then we're just going to return a positive or negative number by subtracting the Y values from each other. So I'll say uh, A.Y minus B.Y. Uh, basically, the, the math under the hood will just work right to reorder the array so that the um, lower Y values will be up front at the array, but the the greater number of Y value will be at the end of the array. So that way the northern characters will be drawn before the southern characters. And now with this in place, we can reload the browser and you should see that, yeah, everything is layering properly. It looks much nicer, feels nicer. Okay, so now we can leverage all of this code that we've written throughout this video into the real star of the show, in my opinion, and that is the global cutscene queue where right now all the characters kind of have their own opinion on what they should do during normal times, if you will. Uh, now we want to stop the action on screen and shift all the focus into one queue of events. And that's going to be the mechanism that we really tell stories with. So let's pop back over to our overworld map code. Get rid of some of these files here. Okay, overworld map code. Uh, at the very top here, we added this flag earlier in this video and we said it's false, but what just happens if we set it to true? When I reload the scene, now the characters themselves aren't going to do any of their kind of pre-scripted behaviors because the game thinks that there's a cutscene running right now and that something else will be happening in the meantime. One thing we need to do right off the bat is that if that flag is true, we need to stop the hero from being able to move around. Otherwise, a player could like break the game by moving the character around during a scripted cutscene, which we don't want. So shutting off that input is going to be as simple as going over to our person code, person JS. We'll find where it takes in arrow instructions, which is right here, keyboard ready and have an arrow pressed. Uh, we're also going to check here that state.map dot is cutscene plane is false. With that in place, I'm back in the browser. And even though I'm touching the arrow keys, uh, the hero is not moving, which is good. That's what we want. So now that everything's kind of carved out for us, let's go ahead into our overworld map code uh, and add a way to actually fire off a global cutscene queue. So kind of towards the bottom of the class here. No, I'll go up a little bit above the wall code. Uh, I'll say start cutscene. And that's going to take in an array of events. When this method fires, we want to set that flag to true is cutscene plane. It's going to be true. Uh, and then by the time it's done, we want to set it back to false. In this method, we're going to do a really similar pattern as what we did in game object. Let's just look at that again. Game object, uh, where we have an async function here, and it's going to kind of fire off a series of events, each one being async. And so we can kind of uh, control the flow that way. So we'll mark this as async. And now here we're going to start a loop of async events, and then await each one. Now before we start filling in this exact code, let's go ahead and just kick off a cutscene to kind of get us off on the right foot here. Um, so this method, we're going to just fire it when the game starts up. So I'll go back into overworld JS and then right after all this stuff, start game loop and init, uh, we're going to say this dot map dot start cutscene. And it just, you know, like we set it up, we're just going to pass in an array of events that look just like what we have on our um, people configs in our overworld map here. So stand left, uh, stand up, all that stuff. The only caveat is that we must also define a who, the ID on um, who should be controlled in this case. So let's go ahead and just um, maybe copy some of these. I'll take this walking command and go over to overworld JS. And um, before any of the stuff fires, I'm going to say who is hero. And again, that lines up with the game object ID. It's the hero character. We want him to walk down uh, maybe a few different times. And then we want to grab a different NPC, say NPC A. Um, she should walk to the left. And then maybe she stands up to look towards the hero. So um, that'll be stand. And you can see that you can just kind of craft up little uh, scenes of what the character should do. It's a lot of fun. 
Um, and again, it's like the key mechanism on how a lot of story can be told in a game like this. Uh, so for this stand command, we'll say time's gonna be like 800, like what we've been doing. So now that we see what this thing kind of looks like, we can go back to overworld map and in our code that runs through the cutscene events, let's go ahead and add a for loop. And now just like we did in game objects, we want to say um, event is going to be a new overworld event passing in everything that it needs. I think we actually called it event handler in that case. And so we're going to pass in a map, which is this, and then we're going to pass in the event that should be executed. So that's like, you know, walk or stand, which one, it's got all the info on it. And that's going to be events at the index of I right now. And then finally, we're going to await this event handlers being knitted there. So even though we're in a for loop that kind of looks synchronous, this await is going to stop and wait for the event to complete before we continue on with the loop. Then all the events will play, and then when everything's done, we can set this flag back to false. So when we fire this up, we should see the events play in order, and those events look like this. Let's go ahead and see it in action. So when I load up the game, immediately you see the hero walks downwards, and then this character kind of moved over here and looked upwards. It looks a little funny, though. It looks like uh, the hero needs to stop earlier, and then she needs to kind of come a little bit further and then face up after that. Uh, so we'll change this one to, well, like she'll, she'll walk left twice, and he'll only walk down once. And now when we load this up, see that now they line up properly. I'd encourage you to take a few minutes to play with this array and, and make different combinations, put different NPCs on the screen, really make the scene your own. It doesn't have to match up with what I have here. It doesn't matter. This is just how the system works. Now I want to reiterate that we're just now scratching the surface of what can be achieved with this overworld cutscene system. Currently, we only have two types of events. That's stand and, and walk. Uh, we're going to be adding a ton more, like text messages that pop up on the screen when you talk to people and battles that start uh, music, like a, a different music track should, should start or like the music should stop playing and a sound effect should fire. All of those things can be overworld events. We're also going to explore uh, different timing on when those cutscenes should start. So currently, you know, init, we're firing off this static cutscene, right? You know, when the game starts. What if we fire one off when we step on a certain spot or when we talk to someone or whatever? Those are all the next things that we're going to cover in the next few videos. Thank you so much for watching this video to the end. As always, if you're getting value out of this, please remember to hit the like button and subscribe for the whole series. That really helps me out. And here's your reminder, if you're working on a game, you should join our Discord server. We got a great group of people in there that are working on indie games. Come in, tell us about your project. We'd love to see you there. As always, thank you so much. See you next time.